Welcome everybody. I hope you can hear me. My name is Richard Johnston. I am an emeritus professor at UBC and a member of the UBC Migration Group. And uh, I am uh, the official host here. Uh, first of all, I just want you to uh, look at the uh, entrance slide here. Down at the bottom left-hand corner, there's the Twitter handle for UBC Migration, at UBC Migration. UBC Migration is the host of this uh, talk. So um, before I go any further, uh, I want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I need to remind you that this event is being recorded. I also want to draw your attention to how you can participate. You can use, if you, if you look at down at the bottom middle right of your screens, you'll see a Q&A function. Uh, you can type questions during the talk, or you can type them during Q&A as you prefer. We will just accumulate them. So you might want to open that screen. You'll notice that when a question appears, there's an opportunity for you to vote on it. And if you vote on it, you can help it move up the queue. And we will tend to give priority to questions that are toward the top of the queue, okay? So you can see all the questions. You can upvote any questions that you want to. Uh, if, if I reckon that the question has been basically dealt with, I can dismiss it from the, from the queue. So that's a bit of a visual help. Um, if you have a question that is for explicit clarification, something in Professor Lee's talk that you, that you think he could clarify for you with a quick answer, flag that, I will be monitoring and I may interrupt to put that question directly to Professor Lee. Otherwise, we'll uh, deal with the Q&A after he's finished his presentation. So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, today's presenter, Professor Xiaojun Li of the UBC Political Science Department. He is an associate professor. He joined us in 2013, uh, having completed a PhD at Stanford. He's currently an associate professor. He is at the same time also a non-resident scholar at the 21st Century China Center at the University of California, San Diego. He's also held visiting positions at Harvard, at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, at the Fudan Development Institute, and the University of Highways, uh, Ho Highways, Hawaii's East-West Center. He's a student of comparative and international political economy with roughly three basic uh, focuses. The impact of domestic politics on the process and content of foreign economic and security policies the impact of global supply chains on trade and investment, and the political economy of trade liberalization in developing and post-communist countries. In all of these programs, he uses China as the primary case. He employs a variety of methods, including interviews, archival research, survey experiments, and large end analysis. His topic today has a Canadian focus and it uses survey experiments. Okay, I'm gonna, I think we're gonna go ahead and just uh, hand it over to Xiao Jun here. Um, and uh, remind you that once he finishes his, his uh, presentation, we will go to Q&A, but you can ask a question at any point. We will just collect them. So, um, uh, and I will read them aloud. So can we turn it over to Xiao Xun? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks, uh, Richard, so much for uh, this introduction. Uh, and, oh, let me see if I can, uh, oh, there, there you go. Um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity here to share my research uh, with the Migration Research Cluster. Uh, this is actually a, a part of a, a bigger project that looks at uh, misinformation in Canadian public opinions on a range of issues. And uh, today I'll be presenting um, part of this uh, specifically regarding immigration. Okay, so um, we, we are aware nowadays that in many countries across the world, immigration has emerged as one of the most pressing issues um, during elections. Uh, we have now populist parties and politicians uh, such as uh, Donald Trump, um, 
who have capitalized on anti-immigrant sentiments and gained uh, support. Despite immigration being a central issue in many of these countries, uh, voters remain highly uh, misinformed about the number, the origin, and other characteristics of immigrants in the host countries. Uh, in particular, uh, a large body of literature has demonstrated that citizens tend to overestimate uh, the size of immigrants uh, residing in their country. Um, uh, so these uh, perceptions of oversized immigrant groups uh, in turn can have um, uh, impact on public opinions, public attitudes toward um, these immigrants. The underlying assumption here, of course, uh, is the group threat theory, which maintains that conflict would arise when minority groups are larger and are perceived by the majority as uh, competitors for resources and political influence. So one way to counter uh, such misinformation, uh, the overestimation of immigrant size, is to present people with facts and data uh, from credible sources. Uh, there is a big literature on uh, misinformation and corrective information. Um, so recent meta-analysis uh, have shown that uh, these uh, corrective messages, they do have a uh, moderate to large effects on reducing such misinformation. Uh, but when it comes to the effect of these corrective information on attitudes, uh, the, the results are actually mixed. Some find that corrective information are effective, others find uh, them to be ineffect ineffective, uh, and uh, some even find uh, corrective information to have a backfire effect leading to worsening attitudes among the public. When it comes to immigration, uh, a number of recent studies have examined uh, the effects of corrective information on immigration size. Uh, the results are also mixed. Uh, again, some studies show no effect from these corrective information and others uh, find um, them to be effective in changing attitudes among the public. So, so this research uh, essentially builds on these, uh, these existing studies that I listed here, uh, but I depart from these works uh, in two ways. Uh, so first, most of these above studies, uh, they focus on immigration stock, which is the non-naturalized resident aliens already living in the country. Uh, but in this study, I'm going to focus on immigration flow that is uh, future waves of foreigners that seek to enter and live in the country. Um, there has been studies uh, that show that these two things are actually very different. So attitudes toward immigration flow is, uh, is different from attitudes toward immigration um, stock. With the, the latter, uh, the stock uh, being um, among the respondents, when you ask them about the stock, they are more acceptant. And people uh, have found that this is uh, sometimes out of a um, moral obligation to help people who are already living in the country. Um, but maybe uh, this is the reason why uh, corrective information does not work that well when you focus on immigration stock. The other reason uh, why I'm actually uh, uh, doing differently is uh, that I'm going to use corrective information on both the absolute and relative size of immigrants. Um, uh, there are two, reason to, uh, two reasons why I'm doing this. Uh, first, um, uh, this is to uh, improve the realism of the informational treatments. Uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, news stories these days uh, on immigration, uh, most of them actually focus on immigration uh, size as, uh, as a raw number. But most of the studies to date, uh, they usually frame immigrant size as a proportion of the total population. Uh, so here, right off the bat, you see um, this inconsistency between what people usually see in the news stories uh, versus what they uh, read uh, in a uh, survey, a public opinion survey. The, the second reason why uh, I'm looking at both the absolute 
uh, the raw number and then the relative size of immigrant, the proportion uh, is uh, to try to minimize the effect of racial bias. Um, there are research on uh, racial bias, which tells us that there is a tendency for people to focus on the frequency of the new uh, numerator instead of the overall proportion, uh, which can result in higher perceived risk um, in the former. Uh, so for example, um, if you tell people that 10 million uh, of the population uh, is, uh, are immigrants out of uh, a total population of 100 million, so that's 10%. Uh, but this is very different uh, from when you just tell them it's 10%, they will be perceived very differently. Uh, and then uh, the 10 million, that number uh, can be perceived to be much more threatening uh, to the native uh, population. So I'm trying to argue that uh, the failure to contextualize the corrective information um, uh, to fix these innumeracy induced misinformation might be the reason that uh, most recent studies don't actually find an effect of corrective information. So what I'm going to do um, is to uh, examine this question uh, in Canada. Uh, so uh, some context uh, of the research in Canada. Uh, Canada is actually uh, uh, one of the countries that has a higher ratio of immigrants uh, than most European countries and the US. Uh, uh, which are subject of most existing research. Um, Canada is often rated as one of the best places uh, for immigration, for immigrants. Uh, immigration issues is less politicized in Canada compared to some of these other, other countries. Um, and the debates uh, in Canada about immigration are usually about uh, uh, flow, uh, new immigrants coming into Canada. In other words, I think uh, if correct information uh, does not work in Canada, it will have an even harder time working in countries uh, where the issue is more politicized. Uh, so more specifically, uh, I in implemented a survey experiment uh, in Canada with a sample of 1,200 Canadian adults. Uh, the survey was implemented uh, through Qualtrics. Um, they used a quota sampling to uh, gather these participants. Uh, and then there are three strata that they try to match uh, with census, which is age, gender, and geographical location. Uh, and the survey was implemented uh, last year, uh, February 2019. Uh, here is a uh, brief look at the sample composition. Uh, once again, um, focusing on these three strata, age, gender, and geographical location. Um, in general, they, uh, they track uh, national census uh, data fairly well. And here is a flow chart of the uh, survey experiment. So we start with an introduction telling the survey participants about uh, uh, the purpose of the study and um, um, also present them with the consent information. Uh, after that, uh, all the participants uh, read a, um, uh, this question, which asked them, uh, well, first of all, which gave them a uh, brief introduction, uh, a background information about um, uh, permanent residence in Canada. And then after reading this information, uh, every participants were asked to the best of your knowledge, uh, how many new immigrants, uh, permanent residents did Canada admit in 2017? Uh, so they were asked to uh, make a estimate uh, to the best of their knowledge. So they entered the number into this, uh, this box here. Then uh, these respondents are randomly assigned into uh, three different groups, okay? Uh, so first in the control group, um, here I basically present them uh, the number that they just estimated. I remind them that, uh, for example, you estimated that Canada admitted 100,000 new immigrants in 2017. Um, uh, do you agree that Canada should accept fewer immigrants? Uh, so that is the main measure. Uh, for their attitudes uh, toward immigration, uh, new immigrants. Uh, so the answer is a five point scale from strongly agree to uh, strongly disagree. So this is the control group. Um, 
In the first treatment group, uh, here uh, I use um, information uh, correction uh, on the absolute size of new immigrants, uh, permanent residents coming to Canada. So I tell them that according to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, uh, 296,346 new immigrants were admitted in 2017. Uh, so they have this information uh, compared to their own estimates uh, and then ask the same question about their attitudes toward um, um, immigrants. The final treatment uh, in this group, uh, in addition to telling them the absolute size of immigrants, I also uh, give them a little bit more context, telling them that this is equivalent to about 0.8% of the population uh, of Canada. Uh, so once again, three groups, uh, control group where there's no corrective information, and then the two treatment groups uh, in which I correct uh, either the size or both the, uh, uh, the size and proportion of uh, new immigrants. Uh, I also asked uh, uh, several additional questions. Uh, in particular, there's this question that I took directly from um, the IRCC annual survey. Um, so they ask this question every year uh, uh, about, um, uh, it's a more of a policy question. Uh, so they tell the uh, respondents uh, Canada's immigration level uh, for future years and then ask them uh, whether or not they think these target numbers are too high or too low or about right. Um, okay, so this is basically the setup of the survey. So let's uh, look at some of the results. Uh, I will start by showing you um, uh, the prevalence of uh, immigration in numeracy, uh, the misinformation about uh, new immigrants coming into Canada. So in this graph, uh, you can see, um, so first of all, uh, the majority of the uh, respondents underestimated uh, the number of new immigrants coming into uh, Canada. This is very different from studies that ask about uh, proportions. So when you ask people to estimate the ratios of um, uh, immigration, immigrants, uh, they, they tend to overestimate. Uh, so here you can already see the difference, right? And the graph here uh, is only focusing on those people who underestimated uh, the number of immigrants coming into Canada, the dashed uh, vertical line, that's the, the actual number. Uh, here you can see that the distribution is skewed to the left. Uh, so uh, many more people uh, uh, actually have, have um, they estimated the, uh, the new immigrants and new PRs to be uh, less than 100,000. Uh, but for uh, all of the analysis later, I'm going to be focusing on uh, this group. So people who underestimate it. Uh, so the idea is that when you present these people with the correct information, uh, because they underestimate it, it, it might uh, heighten uh, uh, the threat perception. Uh, so this will actually lead to um, more negative attitudes toward these new immigrants. Um, but when you um, present them th this information, both in terms of the raw number and in terms of the proportions, uh, I would argue that uh, um, this will actually uh, uh, ameliorate uh, the threat perception. To provide you with some uh, context here, um, the amount of underestimations, uh, um, here uh, are some results from a survey done by Angus Reid Institute in October 2019, uh, which is about um, six, uh, seven months after my survey. Um, so they also wanted to figure out uh, the extent of misperception among um, Canadians regarding immigration. So they had a similar question. Uh, here you can see um, about 53% of the people in their survey or 60% if you account for um, the, uh, the don't knows. Um, so 60% uh, in their survey also underestimated. Uh, so this is slightly less uh, than um, results from my survey, but this is probably because in their survey, they uh, provide an anchor. So they actually told them uh, the Canadian population, whereas in my question, I didn't actually uh, provide such an anchor. So this might be the reason why fewer people in their survey underestimated the number of immigrants. Uh, next, uh, I wanna just 
quickly show you the baseline attitudes toward um, um, immigration. Uh, here I'm looking at uh, the control group. So these are the respondents who did not receive any uh, corrective information. So the, the main question, should Canada admit fewer immigrants? 42% uh, agree and 24% uh, disagree. Uh, and this is also pretty consistent uh, with other surveys. Uh, so here I'm showing you one uh, from ECHO's uh, research, uh, which was done in April 2019, so two months after my survey. Um, in their survey, uh, similar question, are there too many immigrants coming to Canada? They find that 43% of the survey respondents agree with the statement and 13% disagree. Uh, Regarding uh, the question about uh, the policy question, uh, the immigration targets of Canada, um, in the control group, 62% uh, said that uh, the targets were too high, 7% uh, said they were too low. And these numbers are, are also uh, comparable to the IRCC survey in 2018, which found that 57% uh, 57 of their respondents said that the targets were too high and 7% said the targets were too low. Again, these numbers uh, gave me additional confidence um, in the results um, that I find in, in my survey uh, because they are you know, pretty consistent with uh, these other surveys done in Canada. Okay, so uh, to uh, the main uh, finding, uh, does uh, corrective information actually help? Uh, so we we'll first look at um, uh, this question regarding uh, should Canada admit fewer immigrants, right? So in this table, I present to you, these are just the raw numbers, uh, the percentage of people who agree uh, or disagree um, with the statement. Uh, here I combine uh, uh, the five point uh, scale into uh, just three categories. So I combine strongly agree and somewhat agree into one category. Uh, here you can see that the, uh, the, in the first treatment, uh, rem so these are the people who only saw the corrective information about the absolute size. Uh, so 9% more respondents in this group uh, agree with uh, the statement that Canada should admit fewer immigrants. Uh, in the second treatment, um, we only have 49%. Um, and uh, the difference between the control and then the first treatment group is statistically significant, whereas the, uh, the difference between the control and the second treatment is, um, is not statistically significant, even though it's a 7% uh, difference. Uh, in this graph, I show you uh, the marginal effects. Uh, so these are the average treatment effects of corrective information compared to the control group. Uh, so these graphs are, um, are from regression models in which I actually control uh, a number of pretreatment uh, covariates such as age, gender, education. Um, and here you can see once again uh, in the first treatment group, uh, so people who were only shown the, uh, the correct absolute size of immigrants, um, their attitudes were more negative uh, towards uh, new immigrants. Uh, whereas if you provide them with more context, telling them that these immigrants is only uh, less than 1% of the population, uh, the difference, uh, there is actually no difference between uh, the control and uh, the treatment group. Uh, so you might wonder uh, uh, whether or not uh, the size of their underestimation matter uh, so uh, the answer is yes. So we can look at this by uh, breaking down the respondents um, by um, how much they underestimate. So I look at this by, uh, by quartile. Uh, so as you can see in this chart, um, the, the four quartiles. Uh, and in this figure, I, um, I basically re-estimate uh, the models uh, for each of the four quartiles. Uh, for both the first treatment and the second treatment groups. Um, but here you can see that uh, uh, the more uh, uh, underestimations, uh, the more uh, negative their attitudes is actually uh, toward new immigrants. Uh, this is the, the left panel of this uh, figure. Uh, but when you provide them both the absolute and relative size of uh, the actual immigrants coming to Canada, there is no difference. 
uh, the four quartiles um, uh, have similar um, as uh, have similar estimates in terms of um, uh, whether they whether or not they uh, agree with the statements uh, uh, relative to the control group. Uh, here uh, I look at the effects um, uh, by uh, subgroups um, uh, in terms of these pre-treatment covariates, uh, age, gender, party identification, education, uh, whether or not the, uh, the, uh, the respondent is bilingual, uh, which is French uh, and English, and whether or not they were born in Canada. Um, so the results here, uh, uh, once again, um, is um, there are a few subgroups uh, in which you see um, uh, the effects, uh, the higher, effects, uh, uh, treatment effects. Uh, for example, you know, people who were not born in Canada, uh, they, they actually tend to be more negative towards these new immigrants, uh, which I think is understandable, right? Uh, because they might fear about these new immigrants coming to Canada. Um, but if you uh, apply um, uh, a correction for multiple hypothesis testing, uh, the statistical significance actually goes away. Um, So quickly, uh, regarding um, this uh, question, the policy questions, whether uh, Canada's immigration targets are, are too high. Um, so here, this is the, uh, the raw number, again, in this table uh, for the three groups, the control and then two treatment groups. Here, uh, I think the interesting factor is that there's actually no difference between the control and the treatment group. Um, but I think this is probably the, um, uh, because in uh, the question, um, the fact that I actually presented these uh, respondents with the, uh, the targets. Uh, so this might have already acted as a informational uh, correction for the control group. Because so you were telling the control group, uh, these respondents that uh, Canada's targets is between uh, 320,000 uh, to 350,000. Uh, so uh, this is very similar to telling them uh, how many immigrants Canada actually admitted in 2017. So that might explain the reason why there's no difference between control and treatment group. But then there is uh, a statistically significant difference between the control and then the second treatment group. Uh, you know, so when you provide them more context about the ratio of these new immigrants, um, uh, fewer people actually say that the targets are too high. And these numbers are actually, uh, uh, fairly similar to, once again, the Angus Reid survey uh, that asked a similar questions uh, to the second treatment. Uh, they also uh, told them the, uh, uh, the targets as well as um, the, uh, the ratio of these targets as um, a proportion of the total Canadian population. Uh, they find that 41% uh, said that the targets were about right, and 44% said that the targets were too high. Um, here, once again, showing you the, um, the average treatment effects um, from regression models. Um, there's no difference between uh, the first treatment and then the control group, um, but then there is uh, a difference uh, when you provide more context, uh, when you tell them both the absolute and relative size of uh, these new immigrants. Um, so very quickly, I wanna, um, uh, show you some results from uh, a replication survey that I uh, did in the US. So throughout uh, the presentation earlier, I tried to uh, provide you uh, some more context, uh, evidence of external uh, validity by showing you results of these other surveys done in Canada. Uh, but I also tried to uh, replicate the survey in the US. Uh, so the survey was done uh, back in August this year. Uh, we had a sample of about 1500 people uh, so the survey was very similar to the one uh, that I fielded in Canada. Uh, so here uh, I told them um, the, uh, the basic definition of a legal permanent resident in the US uh, and I asked them to estimate uh, uh, the number of uh, PRs uh, coming into the US back in 2019. Uh, and uh, uh, very similar uh, to the Canadian survey, uh, three groups, the control group, uh, where there's no corrective information and then two treatment groups uh, with corrective information. 
uh, either on uh, the absolute size or on both the absolute and relative size of the, uh, of the new PRs. Um, and uh, the findings are actually pretty similar uh, to uh, the Canadian survey. Uh, once again, the majority of the respondents in the US underestimated the number of uh, PRs coming into the US, 82%. Uh, and uh, the distribution is also very similar skewed to the left. Uh, and here are the uh, treatment effects. Um, so this figure is also very similar to the one that you uh, saw earlier uh, from the Canadian survey, right? So when you only uh, correct information about the absolute size, um, the attitudes toward these new immigrants uh, became more negative. Uh, but when you contextualize this, uh, with the uh, proportion of these new, new immigrants, uh, you actually do not see any difference. Um, uh, so I think this um, provides some support uh, for the generalizability of the findings uh, in Canada. Okay, so uh, to quickly conclude, um, uh, what I show uh, in this study is that uh, correct information on immigration, they can lead to attitudinal changes uh, but only when the correct message informs the respondents of both the absolute and relative size of the immigrants. I think these results suggest that um, it is really important for us to actually contextualize uh, correct information uh, in trying to overcome these uh, cognitive biases uh, that are rooted in numeracy induced misinformation among the public. Okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to uh, your questions. Uh, oh, just a little plug here. Uh, you can, um, if you're interested in my uh, other research, you can check them out uh, in my uh, website.